Let's take our Bibles this morning and open to Colossians chapter 1. Uh, We began a new study on the letter to the church at Colossae last week. uh, And the Holy Spirit compelled us to read through the entire letter uh, because that's what would have happened at the church at Colossae when that letter arrived from the Apostle Paul who wrote the letter while he was imprisoned in Rome. Today I want us to read verses 1 through 8, and we're particularly going to be looking at verses 3 and 4 today. Uh, I've titled this message, The Gospel Truth, because verse 3 is where that phrase comes from. When you hear people say, now this is the gospel truth, they use it to express sincerity, or they use it to say, please listen to what I'm about to say. I want you to receive it as truth, because it is the gospel truth. And we know, as believers in Jesus Christ, that the gospel that comes from the Word of God about our Lord Jesus Christ is the absolute truth. And it is the only message that has the power to save sinners from the grave and from hell, and give them eternal life. So let's stand together in in recognizing the authority that the Word of God holds. And and I'm going to read verses 1 through 8 this morning of Colossians 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who were in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit, and it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Father, as we look at this greeting from the Apostle Paul to the church at Colossae, there are so many important details that need to be brought to our attention this morning. And we ask that your Holy Spirit do just that, that you illuminate your word in our hearts that will produce action in obedience. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I did a little word study this week on, on the gospel and the reference to the gospel in the New Testament. And just to share with you a couple of passages and, and attachments that are made to the word gospel in the scriptures to, to, to clearly define it, I'll give you a few of those. Acts 20.24 20, says the gospel of the grace of God. Romans 1, 9, the gospel of His Son. Romans 15, 16, the gospel of God. 1 Corinthians 9, 12, the gospel of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the gospel of the glory of Christ. Ephesians 1, 13, the gospel of your salvation. Ephesians 6, 15, the gospel of peace. Revelation 14, 6, the everlasting gospel. And then here in Colossians 1, 5, the word of the truth of the gospel. So those are just a variety of references to this gospel, this good news that we hold to in our faith uh, that the Bible makes to it. Gospel of Christ, gospel of the glory of Christ, gospel of salvation, gospel of peace. Let that minister to your soul today as we see it described in the word of God. Now the one that is used here, uh, the word gospel in the Greek in verse 5 is the word evangelion, okay? It's the word that we get our English word evangelize from, and the word means good news. But it's important for us to look at the classical use of the word because it highlights the way we need to use the word, all right? So evangelion in classical Greek language was most often used to speak of the news that you got back from war that your team has won, that your country has been victorious. And so they would go off to battle, and they would win the battle, and they would send a messenger back to their hometown that they represent to share the good news of victory. All right, so let's apply that to the way we share Jesus Christ with others. 
Did Jesus Christ not go off to battle to a foreign land, fought that battle, died on the cross, arose again to bring victory, and we get to carry for the nation that we represent, Christianity and and Christ followers, we get to carry the good news of the victory that the battle has been won to his people, right? Is that not exactly what we're supposed to do? with evangelion, evangelizing, carrying the gospel of truth to a lost and dying world. That we have won the battle. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ's victory over Satan, sin, and death. And in Him, if you trust the gospel and surrender to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that victory belongs to you. And you get to go share that good news with other people. I want you to... Direct your attention to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. This this text, Paul does a really good job of encompassing the historical content of the gospel all in one text. And in verses 1 through 4 of 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. And then here's the content of the gospel. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He arose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now that's one of our popular Awana verses, so let me... Let me get all of our Awana clubbers in here to to say that with me. Uh, All right? After Paul wrote, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. And let me hear my Awana clubbers. that, That Christ died for our sins. Come on, let's say it loud. You know this. That Christ died for our sins. And that... All right, guys, come on. I'm going to get on to your listeners for checking you off if you can't do better than that. All right, so uh, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That is the historical content of the Gospel. You may say today, well, I don't know how to share the Gospel. You tell them that Christ died on the cross, arose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and you have shared the Gospel that he came and gained victory over Satan's sin and death, and that that victory can be yours if you will trust in him. It's very, a very simple message with an eternal impact. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ died to provide complete forgiveness of sin and rose again that those who believe might live forever in heaven with him. Now, the second point that I want to make, or the first point I want to make out of this text today using verses 3 and 4, is that the gospel demands several responses from those who believe in it. Okay, this is built into why Paul opened the letter to the church at Colossae the way he did. The gospel demands a response. If you believe the gospel today, there is a reaction that is demanded from you. And I'm going to show you eight of those reactions the first we draw from, from Matthew 4.23, uh, we should proclaim the good news of the gospel everywhere we go, following Christ's example. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. The second response that the gospel demands is that we should always be ready to defend it. 1 Peter 3.15 Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Third response, we are to work hard to advance the gospel in all areas of our lives. Philippians 1.27, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I, am, whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Fourth response, we should pursue the fellowship we have with all representatives of that gospel. 
We should seek to, to participate in brother and sister fellowship around the gospel of Jesus Christ. Acts 2.42 And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Fifth, we must be ready and willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel. 2 Timothy 1.8 Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. And we know that following this gospel does involve persecution. We should be willing to endure that. The sixth response that the gospel demands is that we must make sure, and I want you to really hear this one, we must make sure that our personal lives do not hinder the advancement of the gospel. We must make sure that our personal testimony does not put a stain on the display of the gospel of Jesus Christ in our marriages, in our personal lives. And it says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse, verse 12, If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. We want to make sure that our testimony upholds the gospel that our mouths are supposed to be speaking. The seventh reply or response that the gospel demands is that we must never be ashamed of it. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And then the last response I want to share with you that the gospel demands from you, if you truly believe it, is that you must realize that it carries its own divine power. I don't know about you, but it was extremely helpful to me when I came to the realization that it is not my job to talk someone into salvation. It is my job to present the good news to them, and that good news message has the power in itself to change their life. All right, so that same power that that raised Jesus from the dead, that power is living in me as I share that gospel, uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. And 1 Thessalonians 1.5 says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So we recognize the holy, infinite power that the gospel has. All that we have just covered is the basis behind Paul's introduction in verses 3 through 8, which involves seven aspects of the gospel that we're going to be looking at over the next couple of weeks. First two is that we respond in faith and we react in love. So we'll be looking at those this morning. The gospel truth is received by faith. Let's read verse 3 again. If you'll look at uh, Colossians 1. Verse 3 and then the first part of verse 4. It says, We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. I want you to notice something that the Apostle Paul did here in his greeting to the church at Colossae. He did not take an opportunity in writing his letter to this church that he's heard so many great things about to flatter them. Verse 3, does, verse 3 and 4 does not say, I give thanks for all that you have accomplished in the city of Colossae. I give thanks for your faithfulness and all that you have done in and around your city. Instead, what does he do? He takes the opportunity to show that he fully believes that the work in progress that he's hearing about in Colossae is the work of God, not the work of man. Had this opportunity last night, a, a visiting couple that attended the marriage revival here uh, at New Providence said, man, I just keep hearing about all that you guys are doing down there at New Providence. I said, let me correct something. What you are hearing is all that God is doing down at New Providence. And that's what the Apostle Paul is doing here. He, is, he has heard fantastic things from Epaphras who visited him in Rome while he was in prison who is the church planter that planted this church in Colossae, and he tells him all of these great things that they're doing and how they're standing up for the gospel. And Paul writes to commend them in that, but he says, I give thanks always for God the Father uh, of Jesus Christ. He's the one who's making this happen. Now, I will tell you, for interpretation purposes, 
the word always at the end of verse 3 says we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. That word always, when you're reading verse 3, you need to assign it back to the phrase of giving thanks to God, not to the verb praying. Paul is not saying here that he always prays for the Colossians. What he is saying is that every time I pray for you, I always give thanks to God. So just for uh, interpretation purposes of verse 3, Paul says, when I pray for you, I am always giving thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ as, as I pray for you since I heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. He gave thanks to God for their faith. Now, let's define faith. I want to share a few things with you about this faith, this Christian faith. Faith means to be persuaded of something that it is true and you can trust in it. All right, so let's, let's hold on to that definition. We, we commonly give the definition that it's believing in something you cannot see, right? But we need to go a little further with that this morning. Faith is being persuaded that something is true and you can trust in it. All right, Hebrews 11.1 1 shows us that it is not uh, just a blind leap in the dark. It's not an uninformed jumping off of a cliff, not knowing whether something's going to catch you. Instead, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That word substance can also be translated as assurance. So for you to have faith in Jesus Christ, it's not a blind faith. It's a faith that can look at the evidence. You can look at the evidence of Scripture. You can look at the evidence of all the saints that have practiced this faith around you and what it has done for them. Uh, that's what the whole Hebrews 12, 1 says, that since you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, run this race that's before you. Know that many other people have run that race and finished well and use that as evidence for the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is sufficient evidence given to us for the basis of our faith, scriptures and testimonies. So let me tell you two examples to help drive this point home, that it is not a blind faith. All right, why do you drive on roads that you've never driven on before? How do you know that there's not a 500-foot drop-off right around the curve? It's because you trust in the DOT who have left that road open, and you also know that other cars have gone that way and come back from that way safely, right? So you, you have the confidence and the faith that that road's going to get to where it leads because other people have traveled it, right? How about why do you eat at restaurants that you've never eaten at before? Why do you not have the fear that you may not survive after consuming that food? Well, you trust the inspection process. You trust the score that's on the wall. You trust other people have eaten there and maybe told you about how good it was, and they're still upright, right? That's, so, you, so you go and you eat there. You have a faith based off of evidence that what you're going to receive is what was promised. We do the same thing in Christianity. It's not a blind faith. We look around us, and the person that's sharing the gospel with me has that faith worked for them. Now, for some of us, we would say, no, my testimony's been more of a detriment to sharing the gospel than it is a support of it. You know, and, and we have to work not to be disqualified in the ministry of the gospel and evangelism. We have to show people. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. The millennials, uh, which is a term used to describe anybody born after the, uh, the early 80s, down, around about 81, 82, the millennials, they need to see it work for you before they're going to trust it for them. They need to see it in practice, and they need to see it provide for you in a difficult circumstance before they're going to trust it for themselves. And so you have to be a vessel of the gospel, not just in word, but also in deed. You've got to live it out. You've got to show them what it looks like. Show them the evidence. Show them how it changed your life. Tell them your testimony. Let them know there's substance to this faith that you proclaim. And Paul was giving thanks to God for the faith that they displayed. Faith does not act blindly. It trusts the evidence and it responds in obedience. James 2 tells us it must be accompanied by repentance and obedience if it is genuine faith. True repentance and obedience are fruits that must be present of true saving faith. According to James 2, faith must never be separated from good works. And I love what 
Martin Luther, the uh, theologian of old, said about this. He said, good works do not make a man good, but a good man does good works. And so you, you can't separate the two. Good works do not earn our salvation, but if you're truly saved, good works will characterize your life as a result. So we could say that the, the definition of saving faith is trusting the evidence that Jesus Christ truly is the victor, and we can share in that victory in Him and Him alone. Something else about the definition, definition of true saving faith. It is incomplete unless you include the object. So go back to verse 3, or verse 4. Since we heard of your faith, it's not blind faith, it's not faith that leads to nowhere, but it is faith in Christ Jesus. True saving faith is incomplete without its object. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, saving faith is rooted in the person of Jesus Christ. Many Greek prepositions are used in the, the phrases that I gave you at the beginning of the sermon of the description of the gospel. And in and add and of and, and, and the, all of these different connecting words that are used in describing the gospel, uh, words that in the Greek mean resting upon a foundation, finding a dwelling place in, abiding in, or finding a home in. And it's important that no word, no letter, no punctuation is wasted in the Scriptures. It's all there for a specific purpose. And so in verse 4, when it says, faith in, the gospel in Christ Jesus, that preposition means security and anchor. All right, that particular Greek preposition translated to the English as the word in means security and anchor. So if you have faith in Jesus Christ, then that means your faith is like a house that is built on a secure foundation. You know, and we even heard him reference that when he says, uh, like a builder who builds his house on the, the rock, right? So faith in Jesus Christ is faith on a secure foundation, or it's like a ship that is safely anchored in the midst of a storm. An anchor that is holding that ship stable. That's the kind of faith that Paul is praising God for that the Colossians displayed. Having faith in Jesus Christ is as secure as a house on a solid foundation and as a boat safely anchored. Which brings us to the third point that I want to make today. Not only do we respond to this gospel in faith, but we display this gospel in love. Okay? The gospel truth results in love. Look at the second part of verse 4. All right, I thank God for your faith in Christ Jesus. Since we heard of that faith, and your love for all the saints. One of the visible and strong fruits of true saving faith is love for other people. Specifically, love for fellow believers. We hear this emphasized throughout the scriptures, and I, I want to just stop for a moment. I, I, I've got to share with you today that I love my church. I love New Providence Baptist Church. There is no place I would rather be, and I hope I get to spend the rest of my life right here in New Providence Baptist Church. And let me tell you something that I love hearing, and I just heard it this weekend. I heard this statement made about our church. They said, every time we hear your church's name, it's always attached to something y'all are doing for your community. That is awesome, right? That we are defined by the love that we are having for those around us. That is what defines someone who has true saving faith, is the love that they have for other people. Let me just show you some examples. The Apostle John emphasized this truth repeatedly in his first epistle. Uh, epistle. 1 John 2, verses 9 through 11. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. 
But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Then again in chapter 3, verse 10, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Then again in verses 14 and 15 of that same chapter, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And then in chapter 4, verse 20, he says it again. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? A true child of God will love other believers. Our love for fellow Christians is a reflection of Christ's love for us. If we look at John 13, verses 34 and 35, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So this is the distinction that sets you apart from the rest of the world, is the way you love each other. And if you truly have faith in the gospel, love will be a result. Paul gives thanks to the Colossians for their love, but I want you to notice a very small word that finds itself at the end of verse 4. Notice he says, for their love for some of the saints, or their love for the saints that are like them. No, what does it say? That they have a love for all of the saints, and he is commending them for that. It is obvious that they were not selective with their love uh, for the saints. They didn't have the cliques or the prejudices or the biases or the partiality that existed in in Corinth, and and Paul uh, rebuked the church at Corinth for those biases, but he thanks God for the love for all the saints, regardless of who they are, where they live, what they look like, how they act, a love for all the saints that were practiced by the Colossian believers. Genuine belief in the truth of the gospel and experiential love for other believers are the necessary elements of saving faith. And you know, we had an amazing opportunity to display that on Friday night in Night to Shine. Uh, it, It may not have been comfortable at first for you to love somebody that's not like you, but you found very quick that they were easy to love because of the love that Christ has put in you. And that's how we ought to be responding to people all the time. Uh, All we need to know about someone to extend brotherly love or sisterly love is that they trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Nothing else matters. It doesn't matter the color of their skin. It doesn't matter uh, the the makeup of their their bodies. It doesn't matter the, the way they're dressed. All that matters is that they are a redeemed believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm commanded to love them unconditionally. The reason I love them is because of the love that Christ has shown me. So two sides of the Christian life for today's message, faith and love. True saving faith in the gospel makes itself visible through your love for others. We're saved through faith and we are saved to love. It's more than just a conviction of the mind, it transforms the heart. And a heart that is transformed displays itself in love. So I want us to do something today as we close uh, this time in the Word. I want us to do a self-evaluation. All right, you've been given two key elements that have to be present in order for you to have saving faith. The first one is a substantial, assuring faith in the gospel an assurance that what you believe is true, and the second is a love that is produced by that assurance. And so I want you to bow your heads, and uh, worship team, if you can go go ahead and make your way up. I want you to spend just a few moments. I'm not going to lead you in a prayer, but I want you to spend just a few moments evaluating what you have called up to this point faith or salvation. And, And the evaluation that you can make is, do I have 
an assurance in my heart today that the gospel that I believe in will cause me to inherit eternal life? Do I believe that it is real? Do I have sufficient evidence to believe that it is true? And the second thing is, do I have a love for my brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of who they are? Am I producing a love? Is the gospel inside of me producing a love for those around me? The, as you think about that, the theme for the letter to the church at Colossae is the centrality of Christ. Christ will never be in the position that he needs to be in in your life if you don't have faith in him and if you're not loving other believers. And so just spend a little while on that as the uh, instrumentalists begin to play. I want you to think about the basis for your Christianity, for your faith, and is it producing love in your life as a testimony to others. Father, as we evaluate our own hearts this morning, please reveal to us the, the basis for our faith, the assurance for our faith. May it be Christ alone, the power of your gospel that has saved us from our sins. If there's anyone here today that has had faith or maybe confidence in anything else aside from the person of Jesus Christ, Lord, reveal that false assurance to them today. That they would, that the Holy Spirit would solidify inside of them that Jesus Christ is the one who saves. He is the one who reigns victoriously. The only mediator between man and God. Help them to trust only in Him. And truly save them from their sins. Deliver to their souls the good news of the victory of Jesus Christ on the cross and resurrection from the dead. And Father, for those of us that do have faith in Christ alone, the power of the gospel that has changed our lives, convict us to show that through our love for one another. Convict our hearts this morning, Lord, if, if there is any unloving thoughts or feelings or actions or words that we have spoken to anyone over this last week because that damages the display of the gospel that should describe every aspect of our lives. You have taught us how to love because your son first loved us. And the way we identify that we belong to him is that we love one another with no partiality, with no biases. Father, convict us and move us into that display, that beautiful display of the gospel. Because you loved us through Jesus Christ when we were unlovable. Father, help us to love one another the way that Christ Jesus has loved us. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be in a church that loves its community, that reaches out to the least of these, uh, knowing that, that we are ministering directly to you in doing that. Thank you for the opportunities that you have presented to us this weekend with Night to Shine and the Marriage Revival and being here to worship your holy name together as a church family as the bride of Christ this morning and more discipleship tonight as we come back and, and grow in you Lord teach us to love as you love Lord thank you for loving us in spite of ourselves and saving us from our sins cleansing us from all unrighteousness 
If there's anyone here today that that has not happened with, Lord, I pray you would wash them today from their iniquities and that you would draw them to yourself in a way that they cannot resist, that they would respond immediately to the love that you have shown them. We thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.